Hello, everybody. Excited to have you in class today. We are here to walk through nine founding documents. These nine documents are a part of the College Board exam for advanced placement class on government. And so these are, if you're taking the AP Gov test, maybe in early May, maybe in June, hopefully this class will prep you with some of the content questions. We're gonna go through these in a timeline order. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Constitution Center, and I'll be here to guide us through these big documents. But I'm not alone, and it's awesome. We're gonna have a big party today on these documents. I'm here with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center. Tom, say hi to everybody. Hello. He's gonna walk us through and make sure we get our content right. And then we also have David Olson, who is from Madison, Wisconsin. He is an AP teacher. He's a part of our teacher's advisory board. He is a part of the NCC ed team. And he's gonna give you lots of tips and tricks to take these documents and weave them together for your answers. So everybody, we want you to go nuts, ask questions in the chat, ask questions in the Q&A, and we are gonna fly through these 30 minutes and get you prepped and also sending you lots of positive vibes for your test. And Curry, there, there are undoubtedly some students who are joining us who are gonna be taking this test Monday. Oh so my. That, that, is the, that is the first of the three times it is given. So, so we've got, we will have some crammers with us today, which is excellent. So one thing, let me do real quick, thank you for saying that. If you need a cheat sheet on that, here you go. If you look in that link in the chat right now, about halfway down is an annotated version Word document of the court cases with short excerpts, clips, um, quotes, all the things are going to be dropping in the chat today. So if you want that for yourself, you can find it there, download it, put it in your Google Drive, whatever you need. But without further ado, let's dive in. And let's dive in, Tom, with the Declaration of Independence. So give us the big idea. Why do students need to know about the Declaration of Independence? And what are some key features that might be part of the AP exam that, and for life, able to hold on to? Sure. So this is obviously one of our most fundamental documents. One way to think about it is that it's America's statement of purpose. It's many of our most core principles are right there. I think the two biggest ones that you find are natural rights and popular sovereignty. So the idea here being that we, just by being human beings, that we are created equal, we're endowed with certain rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are our natural rights. These rights we don't get from government, we, we get from nature. Um, but also what we get from the Declaration of Independence is a, a, an account of where government comes from. What is the government's source of authority? It's us, it's we the people. We consent to the government. The, the government is based on the consent of the governed. And then what is a government there for? That's in the Declaration of Independence as well. It's there to secure our natural rights, our right to be treated equally for life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That's what government's there for. And then finally, what's the most important right of all in many ways is that we, the people, then have a right to alter or abolish the government if it's not keeping up its end of the bargain. So we make the contract with the government. The government's there to then protect and promote life, liberty, happiness, equality. If it doesn't do that, then we have the right to alter or abolish it. That's what we were doing as a nation with the Declaration of Independence. And with that, though, also comes a responsibility, a duty on us. We then have to explain to the government and explain to the world why it is we're doing what we're doing. And so the Declaration is both a very, it's a statement of high principles, but it's also our account of the world of what was wrong with what the British Empire was doing. And so there we get both principles and very practical statements as to why we're declaring our independence. And I love that idea that it lays out kind of a vision statement for who we want to be, but at the same time gives reason of why we're able to overthrow a government as well. So that balance between where we want to go and why we're doing the action we're taking right now. I love that idea. Now, after the Declaration of Independence, the next big founding document in our timeline walk here that we are living under as leagues of friendships, as states that are hanging out together for a common purpose, um, that maybe not didn't work so well as the Articles of Confederation. So what should the students know about the Articles? Yeah, the thing to remember is when the delegates get together in Philadelphia to write the new constitution, we already had a national government. And it was defined by the Articles of Confederation. And if there's one thing to take home about the Articles of Confederation, it's that it created a weak, weak, weak national government. 
As Curry said, they described themselves as a league of friendship. But one way to really think about it is that we were a league of states, a group of states that were a lot more like, in many ways, the United Nations than the United States of America. Because the Articles of Confederation, it gives the national government a certain limited set of powers, but the vast, vast, vast majority of the powers that mattered were left with the states. So state sovereignty is central to the Articles of Confederation. The national government itself, a couple things to remember about it. One, it's a single body. It's just a Congress. There's no separate executive branch, no separate judiciary, not even two houses of Congress. It's one single Congress and each state has equal power. So whether you're a big state like Virginia or you're a small state like Connecticut, you all get the same number of votes in Congress. The Articles of Confederation also gave the national government very limited power. So there are things that we think of today as essential to government, the national government, that the Articles couldn't do, couldn't tax, didn't have the power to tax, to regulate commerce between the states, to even raise troops. It required voluntary contributions of troops and money by the states. You can imagine how well that went. And over time, you know, we learned that the Articles weren't working very well, but another key feature of the Articles of Confederation to amend it required unanimity. Every state had to agree. So we, although many people, the, the majority of Americans at the founding were dissatisfied with the Articles of Confederation, wanted to change them, they weren't able to change them because of that unanimity requirement. Yeah, everybody voting the same is just mind blowing that they ever thought that would happen. So they come to the Constitutional Convention in May, um, uh, early May, wind up beginning the convention on May 25th, 1787. And it, you could even say it's like an iterative process. They take a lot that they learned from those articles and they bake it into the constitution. Um, but Tom, when we look at the constitution that comes out of this convention, can you tell us, help the students understand kind of the, the structure of the constitution and how it lays out the power of the branches and also how they interact with each other. So a lot of work there, you got it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the Constitution, in many ways, the big idea here is, so what is the founding generation trying to achieve? Well, it's trying to create a national government that's stronger than the one under the Articles of Confederation, but it's also one of limited powers, because they still knew that if, as you give the national government more power, there's the danger of abuse. There's the danger of the abuse of our liberties. And so they're looking to build a structure where the national government can do certain things that it couldn't do before, but that it doesn't have so much power that is going to oppress us, because then what was the point of the revolution? So let's, yeah, let's walk through the structural constitution, Curry. Maybe that's the easiest way to do it. I think it would be great, and I laid it out in the chat too, but really understanding Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, what's the job, what's the role, what's the power? Sure. So the, the original constitution, so this is the constitution of 1787, it's a preamble in seven articles. We're going to focus on articles one through three, which lay out the branches of government. But just to provide the, the connective tissue, the preamble itself, that initial part of the Constitution says, we the people. And just as we talked about popular sovereignty with the Declaration of Independence, it's also stating that as a clear purpose of the Constitution itself, that it's going to be government by us, we the people, not by a monarch, not by the elite, not by the few. But as we do that, as we empower the national government, the, the framers also wanted to be sure to lay out pretty clearly what the structure of government was going to look like. So with Article 1, it's the longest article of the original Constitution. It gives us Congress. It gives us the legislative branch. Its main task is to make the law. And so what do we get from Article 1? Well, one is that we, 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 the, the founding generation understood the national government's going to have more power than under the Articles of Confederation. And they feared Congress was going to have the most power of all. And so rather than having a single House of Congress, they broke Congress into two. So we have a U.S. House of Representatives, a U.S. Senate, that way to divide power and guard against abuses. The U.S. House of Representatives, representations based on population. So the larger the state, the more representatives in the House of Representatives. So the bigger the state, the more the power in the House of Representatives. But the Senate retains that structure that we saw in the Articles of Confederation. So it's organized under the principle of equal representation meaning that each state, whether it's a big state like Virginia, small state like Connecticut, they all get the same number of senators too. The last thing to remember about Article I is that it also lays out both the powers of Congress. So you, in Article I, Section 8, you get a bunch of different powers that Congress has, some of them responding to the problems with the Articles of Confederation. So Congress is going to have the power to tax and spend for the general welfare, to regulate interstate commerce, do things like that, but also a certain set of limits written in there for, as well, 
for both uh, uh, for, for Congress. So we get that with Article One, sort of a more powerful Congress than before, but also one of limited powers. Article Two gives us the executive branch. And the key thing to remember here is it's an executive branch led by a single president, the executive branch being tasked with enforcing the laws. And so with Article Two, it's a bit shorter than the powers in Congress, but you get some of the powers of the presidency. So for instance, the president is the commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States. Um, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's also, it's, it's a body with the president, what they're looking to create is something that's stronger than the weak governors they had in the states at the time, but something less than a king. So something in the middle of those two things, a, 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 someone who would have enough power to execute the laws in an energetic way, but not so much power that they would abuse our liberties. And then finally, Article Three gives us the federal judiciary led by the Supreme Court. And the two things to remember about the federal judiciary are one, Article Three writes in there the important principle of judicial independence. We wanted a judiciary that was relatively insulated from politics, from the other branches of government. One of the key ways in which we did that was to write life tenure into Article Three, which means that a federal judge will serve for life. So until they die, until they resign, or in the very, very, very unlikely event that they're impeached and removed. But also within the judiciary, what we get is the power of judicial review. And this is simply the idea that the judiciary stands there as a body that can evaluate government actions and say whether they're constitutional or unconstitutional. The big principles here, Curry, and we'll get to them again in Federalist 51 when we get there. There was this idea we're gonna divide power between three branches of government to limit the dangers of, of abuse. And then we're gonna, within each of those branches of government, give them some powers to check the other branches. So division of power and checks and balances to help promote our liberty and limit government abuses. And that's awesome, Tom. That's a great, everybody, I hope the students, you saw the way Tom did that. He's connecting the dots between the, how the constitution with article one, two, and three spreads out power and then makes them interconnect it with checks and balances and separation of powers. And then it said, oh, look, in Federalist 51, that's what they were talking about. This is the power, this is the ideas behind it. So in these questions that you have for the AP exam, you wanna connect those dots and cross documents with each other and even court cases. So Tom, when you talked about judicial review and we think about the power of the court is to interpret and that power is judicial review. What's a key court case that we talked about last week that kids could pull up if they wanted to reference it? Marbury versus Madison. Perfect. There you go. Connecting the dots, people. This is what we're doing. Okay. We get to the end of the Constitution. Most of the people at the convention that are there on September 17th sign it to say, hey, we think this is a great idea. And it's going back to you states for ratification. We want you to vote it, vote it going forward. We only need nine of you to do it, nine states to make it supreme law of the land. But not everybody. There was a group of people that thought, you know what, this isn't great. We were missing some things. So can you talk a little bit about the ratification process and where the pushback came from? And that will lead us to Brutus number one and one of a big voice in that pushback. Yeah, it's an extraordinary thing what the founding generation does here. Because what they do in Philadelphia at the convention is they come up with this framework of government. But Madison, Washington, Hamilton, what they say is it's not up to us. It's up to you, the American people in the states, to decide, do you want this thing? And so we have a series of conventions, state by state, where the people vote for convention delegates, and then those conventions vote, those conventions then vote yes or no. And so that's the ratification process. And looking back at it, it's easy to think that, of course, we're going to ratify the Constitution. But this battle was close. And it was close in important states like New York, Virginia, Massachusetts. There are real battles there. Alexander Hamilton's from New York. There's more anti-federalists than federalists in New York. He has to win that battle. And so what we see in this ratification debates, we see two camps really line up, the federalists in support of the constitution, the anti-federalists opposed to the constitution. And so we're gonna look here at a range of documents, one from the anti-federalists to start, and then some from the federalists. Most famously, we're gonna handle some really important federalist papers. Uh, but should we start with Brutus, the anti-federalist source, Curry? Yeah, I want to give some love to the anti-federalists because we always talk about the federalists and we never talk about who they were talking to in these newspapers. This is a conversation going on across our country and energy is happening and these newspapers are a way to communicate back and forth. So today, maybe we would all do it on Twitter or um, Instagram or something like that, but they were doing it in the newspapers. Yeah, so Brutus, who is Brutus? Well, we, there's still some debate as to who precisely Brutus was. Um, he was a New Yorker, an anti-federalist. The thought, he was, thought is that he was probably Robert Yates, 
who was a convention delegate from New York, who actually left the convention in the middle, saying that what you delegates are doing here, you're going beyond what Congress said we can do. You're trying to create a new government, and that government's too big. It's too powerful. And so Brutus is out here with a series of essays in New York papers, arguing for why there's problems with the Constitution, arguing against ratification of the Constitution. And so what does Brutus say? Well, one thing to remember is many of the anti-federalists are also critical of the Articles of Confederation. So Brutus is very clear. He's like, there are problems with the Articles. Nevertheless, what we have to do is we have to be careful before approving this new Constitution. Because what, what history teaches us is once we give power to a government, that government is going to be inclined to try to take more and more power. And what we're doing here is we're creating a national government that in many ways is going to be just as distant as London. You know, for many of us, we don't travel a lot in the United States here in the founding generation. Being in, in, in you know, Philadelphia or New York, York or one of these big cities on the East Coast, you might as well be London. And so Brutus is concerned about that. And so Brutus is making two big arguments here. One is that political theory, the Enlightenment thought, teaches us that a republic can only work on a small, in, in a small area. So what, what the Federalists are trying to do here, they're trying to create a government, that, a Republican government, representative government that spans all of America. That's too big. What history teaches us, what political theory teaches us is that republics are only going to work in small units, small units where the people know one another, where the people are similar, where they really can collaborate and promote the common good. So it's going to be a disaster. What history teaches us, once a republic gets bigger, once a representative government gets bigger, it collapses. So we should be concerned about that. The other is that the Constitution itself gives the national government a lot of power. The word he uses is consolidation. What's going to happen is all of that power the states traditionally have, it's going to end up in the national government. And that brings power. It brings political decision making away from us, the people in the states, and puts it in a distant national government. And that leads to abuse of power. It leads to tyranny. It leads to the death of our liberties. And both Brutus Brutus, but the other anti-federalists will say, and we'll, it will, this will be the connective tissue for later, one of the things that you could do to make it a little better, put a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. It wasn't there in Philadelphia. Get one in there. Thank you, Tom. That's perfect. And students, we will get to the Bill of Rights, but we want to go through the debate of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists first. Now, the next, I think it's like two weeks later, Madison comes back and with Federalist 10 in response. And the response is really talking about how the system that they set up is going to work for a broad republic. So we, we can talk briefly about who the Federalists were um, and they wrote way more than the Anti-Federalist, but, and then I wanna dive into Federalist number 10. Yeah, so the Federalist papers were just newspaper essays during the ratification battles published largely in New York newspapers. Uh, the authors were Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay, Hamilton and Madison wrote most of the Federalist Papers here, but they end up being because, so remember, put them in context. These are the ratification debates. They're both theoretical documents. So we do look at them today from the perspective of political theory, but they were practical documents. They wanted to explain to people how the constitution was gonna work and why it was a good idea. And so getting to Federalist 10, Curry, we could start right there with James yeah. Madison. I mean, what's amazing about Brutus is he's writing in these newspapers and, ha and Hamilton's you know, reading the argument saying, oh, we have to respond to these things. Hey, you know, James, John Jay, why don't you cut? Let's, let's, let's figure out a series of essays to defend this constitution. And what Madison does here is he takes Brutus's argument about the size of the Republic head on. And what Madison says is, I hear you, Brutus. There are dangers to the government having a lot of power. And I know that all of the smart political theorists say republics can only work in a small community, but I think they're wrong. And I think we're right. I actually think a large Republic is better for a government. And that's really for two big reasons. One is direct, you know, going at you head on, Brutus. There's also a danger to majorities abusing the rights of minorities. And so there's a danger in small republics of a majority coalescing and advancing its own interests and in harming the minority. And what Madison's doing here is the big word in Federalist 10 is faction. What does faction mean for Madison? He's concerned about factions. These are simply groups of people who are driven by passion and self-interest, not reason and the public good. And his thought is that it's actually in a small republic, in small states, in small communities, where you might, it's easy for a majority to come together and then do bad things for everyone else. And so we have to be concerned about that too, because for Madison, factions are just inherent in human nature. If you have freedom, it is the heir to faction. We're not gonna get rid of freedom 
Because what are we doing then? I mean, there's no purpose in government or anything for Madison if we're not going to at least allow freedom. But if there's freedom, there's going to be faction and we have to control it. So the solution for Madison is make the republic bigger. Brutus, you're wrong. Theorist, you're wrong. If the republic's bigger, there's more factions. It's more difficult for majorities to form. And as a result of that, there's a, less of a danger to our liberties through majorities oppressing minorities. But furthermore, he thinks if we make the republic bigger, it's going to do something about the sorts of people that we elect to office. Because Madison was no idealist. He was quite, quite cynical about human nature. But he also did believe that government will work best if, if the people who we elect have civic Republican virtue, that, re that they really care about the public good. And that if, as you make the Republic bigger, the people you elect are going to have broader reputations. And those broader reputations are gonna come from the fact that they're often the best and the brightest among us. They're flawed, they're human beings, of course they're flawed, but they'll be better than what we get in a small Republic. And I love like almost the bookends of the way Madison thinks about this. One is set up a structure that contains the innately negativity of human beings but also look for the best of the best. And like seeing the worst to end the best is a two-sided coin. Now, when we think, uh, you mentioned this earlier, Federalist 51, when we dive into Federalist 51, this again, looks at that structure. How do you set up a structure that channels, it always reminds me of a parent taking your kids extra energy and channeling it into something good. And that's like Federal, that's Federalist 51 is trying to say, okay, we're gonna set up a structure that channels people's natural behaviors into good. Sure, that's, that's, that's a great way to think about it, Curry. Federalist 10, faction. Federalist 51, it's all about separation of powers and checks and balances. So it's Madison taking quite seriously this idea that there's a danger to giving a national government a lot of power. So what do we do in those circumstances? Well, we, under, we need to recognize there's going to be abuses. We have to recognize that who's going to be running for office? These are going to be ambitious people that are going to want to seize more power. Brutus isn't wrong about that. But what Madison is saying is right about the Constitution is we have figured out a way to counteract those problems. The famous quote, is, of course, is ambition must be made to counteract ambition. But what that simply means is that what we are going to do with power in the national government, we're going to give it more power than under the Articles of Confederation. But we're going to separate it between three branches of government, a legislature, a presidency and a federal judiciary. And the legislative branch, we think that's going to be the most dangerous one. So we're actually going to split that in two as well. That's bicameralism. So there's a separation of powers. We're not putting too much power in any one place. And the one place where we think power is most dangerous, we're splitting it even further. But from there, we also want to do within each of those different branches of government, provide them with powers to check the other branches. So, you know, Congress may have the power to pass important national laws, but the president has the power then to veto them if the president think there's, thinks there's, for instance, a constitutional problem. But furthermore, Congress can come right back in and override the veto. So there's this dynamic process of one side being able to check the other and check the other. And then in, you know, at the back end, we also have a federal judiciary that has judicial independence, as we talked about, that can then hear challenges to the constitutionality of the government's action and be able to say, yes, this is constitutional or no, this is unconstitutional. And so with all of this, the hope is that you can divide power limit abuse, there's also an optimistic part of this too, where it's, it slows politics down. It forces people to really confront the best arguments on each side. And the only way you're gonna get through this whole system is probably if a bunch of different people who think different things agree. And so it's meant to promote compromise. And so that's the idea that it's both uh, meant to check abuses, but also hopefully to result in better policy. And it's almost like create it to create conflict to force compromise, which I think is really <laughs> interesting. Uh, now, the next one, you know, let's bring in Hamilton here. And we know Hamilton loves a powerful, energetic president. You know, he tried to, he led with that speech. And at the end, he's coming back in the Federalist Papers with the same idea. Yeah, so it's a Federalist 70, all about the presidency. And it's Hamilton ad addressing, you know, one of the big, one of the big challenges at the convention really was what do we want the president to be? We know George Washington is going to be the first one. So we know that he's going to help set important precedents. Well, what do we really want the president to be? And then these concerns that are we going to create another king? Are we going to create an elective monarch? Are we going to have this single person who is, you know, uh, the, the, the center of power in the national government and will therefore in all likelihood abuse it? And that was a serious problem because remember, like, we, we didn't fight a revolution to cast off a king to then elect one. Like, th this is like a serious problem. But what Hamilton says is, no, 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 you, you're not totally wrong to be concerned about these things, but if that's overstated. 
One, what we know is that the Congress is going to be the most dangerous branch, or at least that's what the founding generation thought. And so therefore, one thing you're trying to do with the president is create another person in government that can check the abuses of a powerful Congress. How are we going to do that in a way that's most con consistent with Republican government and most consistent with avoiding government abuse? Well, we, I, Hamilton says it's having a single president. And with that, you get two big things, energy and accountability. With a single person, they can act without having to coordinate with a bunch of different people. In the end, the buck stops with the president. The president gives orders and things happen. Doesn't mean the president doesn't listen to people, but it was designed so you would have one person in charge that can direct the enforcement of the laws. That was meant to lead to good law. It also, practically speaking, for a national government, it's useful to have a single head of state that can deal with other countries. So part of this is also America on the world stage. We're gonna be a great nation. Part of being a great nation is to have someone that can interact with the rest of the world. The other thing though, is that when you have a single person, they are most accountable. There's nowhere to hide. You can't blame subordinates. The buck stops with the president. And with that, the president will make decisions, will act with dispatch, act with energy, enforce the, enforce the laws in various ways. And if the president somehow messes up, the president gets tossed from office. It's that simple. Awesome. And then the, the last Federalist paper that we'll look at is Federalist 78. And that's really about the courts and defining and saying, what is the point of the courts and what is the role of the courts? So Hamilton here, he's warning one thing about the courts. So the anti-federalists are concerned about very powerful national courts. Hamilton says to them, no, no, no. If you're looking at this new national government, the judiciary is going to be the weakest branch. It's going to be the least dangerous branch. It has no army. It has no money. All it has is judgment. It has its judgment. Um, and so, but nevertheless, what we've tried to do with the judiciary is we've tried to make it independent of politics, independent of the elected branches, and it's gonna serve this important role in our system. It's gonna interpret our laws, and it's gonna ensure that uh, the government actions are consistent with the constitution. So that's judicial independence. And then judicial review is, the, is this idea that in the end, what, they, what they, the courts are gonna do is they're gonna say yes or no, constitutional or unconstitutional, when challenges are brought to governmental actions. Awesome. And all these debates, all these discussions wind up going back to the three dissenters and answering their call for a Bill of Rights. So the three dissenters at the Constitutional Convention had a lot of complaints, but one of them that it was no Bill of Rights. So throughout all this debate, the ratification process, a Bill of Rights comes into play. And what does the Bill of Rights really do, those first 10 amendments added to the Constitution? What does it spell out and lay out as a part of this new Constitution? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing to take away about the Bill of Rights is, is, you know, it was an attempt to write many of our most cherished freedoms into the Constitution. So you're right, the dissenters, so those, those three dissenters, Elbridge, Gary, Edmund Randolph, and George Mason at the convention, they're there throughout the convention, they play an important role in the convention, but they refuse to sign the Constitution at the end of the convention. Two big complaints, one, there's no Bill of Rights, the other related is that the national government has too much power. And so what the Bill of Rights were all about was about trying to accommodate some of these concerns that began with the dissenters. And this argument ran through with the anti-federalists and the ratification debates. And so in the first Congress, James Madison takes it upon himself to be the primary author of the Bill of Rights that writes many of our most cherished freedoms into the Constitution, like free speech, religious liberty, right to a jury trial, all sorts of things like that. These are amendments one through 10 in the Constitution. Part of it was to write these freedoms into the Constitution so they'd be protected. The other though for Madison was to ensure that people of goodwill who opposed the constitution would still see that we, the new government, we're listening to you. We hear your criticisms, your dissent, your dissenting opinion mattered to us. And if you're gonna keep dissenting, and I bet you are, I hope you do it within the new constitutional system and not outside of it. And so the last just practical things about the Bill of Rights, Curry, it originally only applied to the national government, not to the states. And then it's through the 14th amendment and later Supreme Court decisions, through the process of incorporation where many of these protections are then applied to state abuses so that over time, the Bill of Rights truly becomes a national charter of freedom throughout America everywhere. And I think that's really important. And Emily asked about it too, that this idea that the Federalists wind up writing the Bill of Rights, and it is really trying to bring the ideas of the anti-Federalists into the fold to say, look, we're doing what we said we're doing. We're coming back and forth and having debate and then making something better. Now, when we think of this last document and we talk about making something better in our country better, it wraps in the whole Bill of Rights and it pulls us back to the ideas of the Constitution, we the people, but the Declaration of Independence and what are our values and have we lived up to that vision of all men are created equal? 
So we'll start with Martin Luther King, and then we're going to dive into the letter from a Birmingham jail. Yeah, so in many ways, letter from a Birmingham jail ends up being maybe the clearest articulation of Dr. King and his allies in the civil rights movement, their approach to change and their approach, pr approach to defeating Jim Crow and advancing the cause of equality in America. And so what is sort of one of the most notable things about the letter, at least from my perspective, it's that King lays claim to the mantle of reformer in America that roots reform in foundational principles and founding documents. It's why this whole class is so important. It's that so many of the figures that push for a better America rooted in the important founding sources, like the Declaration of Independence, like the Constitution, like the Bill of Rights. Dr. King does that here. It reminds me, though, of other figures throughout American history, like Frederick Douglass in the 1800s, or Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Francis Harper pushing for women's rights and women's suffrage. Um, so a lot of figures like that. But what Dr. King is saying here, it's an interesting document because it's arising out of the direct action that was taken, direct action protests that were undertaken in 1863 in Birmingham, Alabama. This spurred violence against the civil rights protesters. Dr. King's eventually arrested. And so he's in jail writing this letter. And his audience here, it's not, it's, it's quite particular. He's writing to fellow members of the clergy. And his main concern is trying to explain his actions to white moderates. And so these are people out there in America who are sympathetic to the ends of what the Dr. King and the civil rights movement are trying to achieve. But their complaint is, do you really need to do all the protesting? Can't you just work in the legislature? Can't you work in the courts? Can't you just work through normal politics? We're making progress. Just wait, be patient. And what Dr. King is saying is, no, 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 no. This is a time for urgency. Our patience has run out. People who are oppressed, people who demand freedom, they can only take it for so long. And we've heard to wait, wait, wait for a really long time. And you know what happens, what history teaches us is waiting. If you choose to wait, you're going to keep waiting because those in power are going to stay in power unless you directly challenge them. And so the answer here for Dr. King and the civil rights movement is nonviolent direct action. So what he says is we've tried to negotiate with the governments that exist. The status quo is just there in place. No one wants to negotiate with us. So we're going to use protests. We're going to use sit-ins. We're going to use marches to force people to take notice of what we're saying. And the hope is that we could create what he would call constructive tension in the communities that can then perhaps bring the powers that be back to the negotiating table so we could make things better. And a key part of his theory here is that civil disobedience is a really important part of it, that there are laws out there that are unjust. Jim Crow segregation is unjust. What natural law theory teaches us is an unjust law is no law. We don't owe any allegiance to that law. And what's the greatest way to honor the rule of law in America and throughout the world and throughout history? It's to, in the face of an unjust law, say, no, I'm not going to follow it, but I'm going to do that openly with love, with an open heart, and accept my punishment. And that through that, perhaps we can actually finally get some change in this country. And probably, hopefully through that, we can finally realize the promise of the Declaration, the Constitution, the Reconstruction Amendments. And, you know, the, 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 the greater chart of progress in American constitutional history. And I think that is such an important thing to understand that these documents are saying what our vision are, how our laws and our principles should align. But it's the actions of the people ensuring that they happen through protest, through pushing, running for political office, through having debates and discussion. All these actions are what really make it work and happen. So I think it's a fascinating way to loop all the documents back together. Well done there, Tom. It was really well how you weave them all back together again. I love it. Um, one final question. Would you like to break down the Ninth Amendment for the students? Just because that's a hard one. One of the students asked, they would love to hear your take on the Ninth Amendment. So the Ninth Amendment, some scholars say it writes a certain vision of natural rights into the Constitution itself. I think it's there mostly that most people would read it. I think most scholars would read it as an answer to what. So let me back up. So James Madison and the Federalists, many of them didn't think we needed a Bill of Rights. And their main concern was that once you write out a Bill of Rights, it's going to do two things. You're not going to get every right in there. And so we're gonna end up privileging the rights that are written and then maybe think we don't have the rights that are unwritten. But in fact, we have so many rights, we can't get them all into the Bill of Rights. The other is that even the rights that we write into the constitution, we're not gonna do it in as robust a way that those rights are actually broader than any way we can put them into writing. And so the Ninth Amendment is understood to a certain extent as a response to that. And what it's saying is when you read the rights that are in the Bill of Rights, 
keep that criticism in mind. There are, there are going to be rights that exist that aren't specifically written in there. And so we should read the constitution in sort of a, a, a rights protective way, in a rights generous way. Um, and over time, the Ninth Amendment arguably hasn't done a lot of work before the Supreme Court, but it's an important statement of principle at the beginning that you can also see its spirit in Supreme Court cases over time that have recognized certain rights that aren't explicitly written in the Constitution, like say the right to privacy or economic liberties earlier in the 20th century. And those are really contentious areas of constitutional law precisely because the question is, well, where do we find these rights? Um, but the Ninth Amendment uh, uh, keeps us uh, aware of that Madisonian challenge to not just feel so limited to just what's written specifically in the Constitution. Awesome. Okay, a couple more questions. The students are making sure they're getting all their amendment <laughs> questions in now. Um, can you go over the 26th Amendment? And Tom, I would love for you to do what you've done in classes before, where you loop 15, 19, and 26, so the students can see them as expanding the vote and how they work together. Yeah, so yeah, so I mean, one of the great things, so one of the things we learn about the original constitution is that it writes that amendment process in there. It makes the amendment process easier than with the Articles of Confederation, but it's still really hard. Um, and so it requires great consensus often to amend the constitution. But one of the great reform projects written into the constitution over time is the expansion of voting rights to different groups or different categories of Americans. The 15th Amendment, which happened after the Civil War in 1870, uh, it, the 1870 is the 15th Amendment, uh, banned racial discrimination in voting. Women's suffrage, which came in the 20th, early 20th century, uh, is the 19th Amendment, and so that's banning sex discrimination in voting. And then with the 26th, what it does is it bans, uh, bans a form of age discrimination in voting. And the 26th Amendment was important for a couple reasons. One is before we actually ratified it, most states set the voting age higher than that. So the voting age was 21, I think, in a majority of the states before the 26th Amendment was ratified. But as we've seen in many times in American history, one way in which groups push for new voting rights is precisely because they're willing to sacrifice their lives for their country. And so the 26th Amendment arises out of the service of many young people in Vietnam who are, are willing to go over to Vietnam, give their blood, give their lives for their country, but then would come back home and not have the right to vote um, in their own states. And so the 26th Amendment was in part about that, about making sure that those 18 and older have a right to vote. 